Labor's under siege right now, and uh, you see it in the Midwest. It seems like the Midwest is the battleground. You, everybody knows what's happened in Indiana and Wisconsin and Michigan, and I'm very proud that the Illinois labor movement has crossed those state lines and gone into those battles and stood right there with their brothers and sisters in other states. But you know, on conference calls even this morning, you know, Missouri is now under attack. Iowa's under attack. So. We feel like we're being circled. But sometimes I have to remind myself that labor's been at this well over 100 years, 100 years plus. And looking at our, our gains, what we have today isn't without battles, you know, fights after fights after fights. Every time they come out with a new jobs report or a new analysis on the economy, from the labor perspective, somebody decides to write an obituary, our obituary, right? We're below 12 million workers nationwide now um, that are organized. You know, but that doesn't tell the whole story. They write the obituary and they throw out these numbers as if this is really what the state of labor is. But what they don't say is how many people want one, right? Does anybody know what that number is? Because we, we know, we've been able to ascertain it, right? We have 12 million now, but if people were free to join a union free of interference in this country, how many people would join a union today? Who knows? Shout it out. 60 million workers would do it today if they could. So where's the disconnect? Why does that happen, right? Why do we wind up with a situation where we only have 12? What they don't tell you is that union avoidance and union busting has now become a multi-billion dollar industry in this country. Think about that, a multi-billion dollar industry. Walmart is our largest private employer, 1.4 million employees. Um, you know, our number two pri largest private employer is the post office. And we know what's happening to the post office. And the post office currently has around 300,000 employees. So it's not that Walmart is big uh, by a little bit. Walmart is massive uh, by leaps and bounds. And if you just think about Walmart in relationship to the size of all of these other huge retailers, I mean, Walmart uh, you know, is larger than all of them together. And so the question that I think that, you know, the OCW and Walmart workers together, and I think we all need to really continue to grapple with is, is there's not a path forward for a more balanced economy. There's not a path forward for a labor movement unless we deal with Walmart. Um, and, you know, because how do we function in an economy where the largest private employer is a creator of poverty jobs, part-time, uh, disposable workforce and its impact well beyond uh, just the stores. The only country where Walmart is 100% non-union is the United States. The only place where Walmart uh, refuses to allow workers have a voice, refuses to recognize any type of organization uh, in, its, in its stores is the United States. Everywhere else, workers are union, they have collective bargaining agreements, they have, you know, they have a path to uh, knowing what their raises are going to be, they bargain over issues in the stores, you know, they have, you know, they're allowed to have you know, union offices inside of the stores. I mean, it's, it's a completely different experience. Walmart was very good at making workers feel very isolated and that their problem was their problem. And when we started to create paths where workers could connect, there was light bulbs. Like people were like, wait a minute, you know, I'm not the only one feeling this way. I'm not the only one facing this. I've been with Walmart for four years and I'm still making under $10. And uh, I recently tra transferred from Forest Park to Wheeling and I'm seeing the same thing. I thought it was just in our store, and it's, it's over in all the stores, you know, because everyone you talk to has the same story. But uh, I'm forced to live with a friend of mine because I can't afford an apartment of, of my own. Walmart has a thing that they play favoritism. You can ask for a position, and um, you've been there a while. This people's been there 16 years or so, and I've been there for four, and. I've seen people walk in and ask for the same position that I asked for, and they wouldn't give it to me. They say they didn't have the position open, but these people walk in and they'll give it to them because the managers know them. You know? And that doesn't make you feel good. As a matter of fact, I've cried because of it, and I had ill feelings for the person that you know, got the job, and it really wasn't their fault, you know? but I'm human. You know? And uh, some of the things that they do, you know, it just makes you feel bad. You know, you can't even afford an apartment of your own. And, you know, it's not how they talk to you. It's just how they treat you. They act like you're not a human being, you know. And um, 
that was the reason why I, I joined our Walmart because I wanted some help. Uh, it, it couldn't be like this. I can't afford. I'm I'm an older person. I don't have any experience at a lot of things. So I'm praying that you all will help us too because it's not good to work in a place where you have no say so about anything. For Black Friday, I took off, and uh, I was punished for it. You know, I went back to work, and um, they told me I was. You know, I couldn't move around in the store. Like if I did want another position, I couldn't get it for uh, till next December. Because I took all for Black Friday to, you know, to go with my our Walmart to organize and, and, and make things better for us. They don't want anything better for us. They like keeping us in the position we are because they don't try and move you around. They have different people working in, uh, like you're one person, you're working three different departments. And you can't get your department straight now because you may be on the cash register or something. And they fault you for that. They blame you for that. And that's unfair. It's just a whole lot of different things that they do that, you know, it makes you feel inhuman. And, and that's not a good way to feel when you're working on job. Too often we just think about the question of a union as collective bargaining, right? We, we define what a union is or what a, a work organization is just under the terms of collective bargaining. And the kind of work that you're seeing from our Walmart leaders is, is they are using collective action every single day in the stores to fight against Walmart, to make changes. They're using their ability to strike, to, to build a, a bigger message about what's wrong with this company. You know, and so the bottom line here is, is by saying that we're gonna stop waiting for the government and that we're gonna stop waiting for employers to say we have a right to build organizations, that we have a right to build worker organizations, like that's been the biggest change when we think about the work here. When you hear the story of Rose, when you hear all the other kind of stuff, in the past, again, as we learned from the previous campaigns, Walmart's argument always was, well, we can't pay Rose more because that would impact our customers. We can't pay Rose more because that will raise prices for us. We can't give Rose health care that she can afford because that will, that, will, that will hurt customers. How is it gonna hurt customers when you have 42%, you know, the same wealth as 42%? So getting the Walton family out there has been a critical part of making this debate about Walmart chooses to keep people in poverty. This isn't them protecting their customers. Retail workers, whether they're Walmart, Costco, um, you know, CVS, anybody, Target, they actually have more power than they know. They have more power, I'd argue, than a lot of other workers in our country, right? Because for retail workers, anywhere between 25 and 40% of a retailer's sales happen in a six-week window. From Black Friday to Christmas is anywhere between 25 and 40% of a retailer's annual income sales come in in that window. There aren't a lot of other workers that have a six-week window that if they can take a stand in that window and challenge a company in that window, that they can make that company's year or break that company's year. You know, and that's what retail workers have. And this Black Friday was our beginning to say, let's start to see what happens when we take action on Black Friday. And so our theory was we want to establish Black Friday as a new front for retail workers, a new front uh, for uh, Walmart workers, and that we want to win the battle before Black Friday, right? I mean, our, our theory was is that all of the work we did leading into Black Friday is what made Black Friday uh, possible. Walmart's hammer throughout its entire 50 years has been people who stand up, it takes them out. And the difference here now is workers are responding by using Walmart's retaliation to turn it against Walmart through striking and using the right to unfair labor practice strikes, which Walmart can then, you know, legally is not supposed to, cannot replace people, but now using that as a tool to take on this company like they've never seen before. And then we wanted to use the moment to really educate about conditions and, and what's happening in retail. And again, we had a goal on Black Friday of let's see if we can get a thousand actions um, at a thousand Walmart stores on Black Friday. Um, you know, and again, Walmart workers striking, leading that. And some of those strikes were one worker at a store. Some of those strikes were 50 workers at a store, right? And, and it was somewhere all in between that. And what was fascinating was the fact that people responded, right? People are ready to stand with workers that are ready to stand up, whether it's one worker, whether it's 50 workers, whether it's a thousand workers. And we saw on Black Friday an unbelievable outpouring. I mean, here in Chicago, right, we were figuring, you know, we've never done this on Black Friday. We never said, would anybody come out on Black Friday? Would people even, you know, it's not a day that people, most people are still digesting their turkey. Um, you know, and we saw this outpouring across the country that I just think was amazingly unimpressed, was unprecedented. We had actually had actions at over 1,200 Walmart stores. 
Uh, we were able to raise over $200,000 just through small donations for the strike fund for Walmart workers. We dominated online. And then we had over 30,000 people across the company com country come out and stand with Walmart workers as they, as they challenged this company on Black Friday. Uh, a day like I've never seen in my 20 years in the labor movement. Um, and again, just huge outpouring of people standing with Walmart workers and standing with them. For Walmart, you know, the question is, is they've responded pretty quickly, right? You know, they're, they're, they, they gave in on scheduling, which is a huge issue for retail workers. There's actually no more important issue for retail workers. You could make $100 an hour as a retail worker, but if you only get three hours, you're still in poverty, right? And so, like, the ability to get hours is really a power, is a tool of power for retailers, but it's, it's also a critical thing. And so Walmart is saying that they're going to open up their scheduling system to allow workers to get access to more hours, which is, which is a huge concession. It has been the no, one of the number one issues that our Walmart has been working on. Uh, secondly, they, they're going to hire veterans, and they're also going to be doing um, a new Buy America program, which, you know, the irony of Walmart, who has been, you know, one of our biggest deindustrializers now, is going to save the American manufacturing is just uh, a little painful. Um, but, you know, but the reality of it is, is most people saw this for what it was, right? Walmart's image has been hurt. Walmart's image is under attack. And so Walmart um, has been responding with, um, you know, this is just a PR stunt. People don't give it much credibility. The company really is losing, it, is losing its credibility. And ultimately, the company is actually really worried about its image. It's actually launching a rebranding campaign called the realwalmart.com. Um, we've launched really Walmart.com. So, um, <laughs> but you know, the idea here is the company is really watching and is, is feeling the pain of all the work. So everybody who came out on Black Friday, having an impact. Every worker who stood up is having an impact. Everybody who's standing up against this company, this company is feeling it and responding. Um, and again, the difference of, to all of this and the work of this campaign comes down to a very simple fact. We've created a new model for workers that allow them to stop waiting for the government and for their employer and for their employer to give them the right to organize. And all of that has been at the foundation that has made all of, all, of the, all of the rest of this happen. 2012 was Walmart's 50th anniversary, right? They've been around for 50 years. And for Walmart's 50th anniversary, for the first time in its history, it's faced strikes in its stores like it's never seen before. It's faced strikes in its warehouses like it's never seen before. It's faced community opposition across the country like it's never seen before. It's faced a Black Friday like it's never seen before, and it's faced actions on a coordinated day in 10 countries across the, across the globe on the same day like it's never seen before. We heard about the Walmart stores, um, but we don't often think about how stuff gets to all of these retail stores. And so warehouse workers really are kind of an unseen but critical workforce in our country. So this is the uh, typical supply chain uh, for a big consumer products retailer such as Walmart. So you have a lot of manufacturing in southern China that comes through the West Coast ports. And then about half of that stuff that comes through those West Coast ports, the ports of LA and Long Beach, goes on a rail car and ends up right here in Chicago. So you can see how important and central in many ways Chicago is to the goods movement industry, the way we get our stuff. That system is what we call the logistics system. And it's key to the profitability of the biggest retailers on the face of the earth. And so again, Chicago is critical to this entire system. We have half a billion square feet uh, of retail space. Um, we've got, uh, we are now the third largest container port in the world by some estimates. So more stuff gets shipped through here uh, than any port, than any area in the Western Hemisphere. Walmart is the largest shipper in the world. They are the largest trucking industry in the world. They are the largest warehouse operator in the Western Hemisphere. Um, you know, Dan talked about how big Walmart is as an employer. Walmart also has a massive impact in a whole range of industries outside of retail. So everything from food, apparel, electronics. Uh, but they basically determine conditions for the uh, warehouse workers in this country. Uh, and in Chicago, that means about 100,000 warehouse workers. Chica uh, Walmart, again, is the biggest warehouse operator uh, in the United States. Most workers in the warehouse industry, and particularly in the Walmart supply chain in this area of the country, are temps. So about two-thirds of the workers are temps. Um, Chicago has uh, one of the highest, and particularly 
Will County, where most of the warehouses are, has the highest concentration of temp agencies anywhere in the Midwest. If you go to Joliet, on the east side of Joliet, there are no permanent jobs. They are all temp jobs. That's because of the warehouses, uh, and in particular, companies like Walmart. And workers typically remain temps. Uh, these are not summer, you know, these are not college students working for the summer and then going back to college. These are perma temps. So workers who are working for a succession of different temp companies, many times in the same warehouse for years. Well, I, I worked as a temp for six years. Uh, have not received no benefits such as uh, sick days, uh, holiday pay, vacation. Uh, I trained white people how to do their job. And guess what? They received a permanent job, the living wage, with the benefits. Um, also is, I, while I was a temp, uh, landlords refused to, uh, to rent me a place to stay because I didn't have a permanent job because I was a temp. Uh, while I tried to get me a, a check, you know, go to the check cash place loan, try to get a loan, they refused me because I was a temp, even though I worked at the same place for six years. Um, today, uh, what's going on at, 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 at Dell Money, uh, a lot of workers are receiving poverty wage, and these workers have been working there for years. Uh, each time I've been there for a year, I demanded me a raise. I, I said, I can't work on time. I'm here every day. I even came to work on uh, sick days because I, I couldn't afford to uh, take a day off being sick because my check don't come up short. Or, hey, I'm a temp. They might fire me because you're a temp. They don't have no reason to give you no answer why they got rid of you, right? Uh, these workers right now, they're going through health and safety issues. Like my friend, he got fired because he had a chemical in his eye. And they fired him because of his injury. And today, most of these workers uh, suffering through injury are afraid to report the injury because they're afraid of losing their jobs. Um, we are up here packing fruit and vegetables and food for Walmart that we can't even afford uh, for our own selves. Um, that's why today I'm an organizer for what for uh, where I was working for justice to make a change for workers to have a living wage, a permanent job with affordable benefits. Warehousing is now a poverty job. Wages average below $10 an hour. Two thirds of the workers are temps. Uh, sick days and things like that are unheard of. Wage theft is rampant. Uh, you know, like Tori said, you see workplace injuries. Uh, we've been taking on gender discrimination in the warehouses, uh, racial discrimination, uh, and more than anything, retaliation against workers who stand up for their rights on the job. Um, so what are we doing? Um, our strategy uh, is fairly straightforward. First, we're educating people about their basic rights, primarily their rights to make change in the workplace, their rights to come together under Section 7 of the NLRA uh, and act as a group in order to improve things in their workplace. Um, we're bringing together, uh, we've started an organization called the Warehouse Workers Organizing Committee. This is an actual dues-paying organization of warehouse workers that uh, includes uh, employed warehouse workers and semi-employed warehouse workers, and workers from several different locations, not just one particular uh, work site. So this is a different model of how you set up a union uh, than what we're typically used to seeing. So we're, we're here to talk about new models, new ways for workers to gain representation, because what's happening with working people uh, in our country really cannot, and I want to emphasize, cannot go on. And I'm talking about record inequality, I'm talking about the diminished power uh, and fractured lives of working men and women, and I'm talking about the $20 billion in bonuses that Wall Street got this year. You see, this subject, new models and ways to represent workers, carries an implicit criticism of the model the labor movement uses today. And quite frankly, some people think accepting criticism uh, is a mark of vulnerability. But I'm really not concerned about appearing vulnerable. Because working people and labor unions have been vulnerable for years. And no amount of bluster or head in the sand insistence that everything is fine will change that reality. So yes, working people in America and our unions are vulnerable, but vulnerability presents us with both a challenge and an opportunity. So I'll begin with a hard look at the landscape 
for worker representation in America. And I gotta say, it's not very flattering. To be blunt, our basic system of workplace representation is failing, failing miserably to meet the needs of America's workers by every critical measure out there. The numbers give us all the proof that we need. Not even 7% of the private workforce in America has the security and stability of a union contract. For the past few decades, falling union membership in the private sector had been offset by growth in public unions. But public union membership is now falling too, partly from job losses caused by the recession, but also and mainly because of political attacks designed to take away that membership. Now I don't have to cite chapter and verse because you know just as well as I do that private sector union growth paved the way for public union growth. And now the reverse is proving true. And last year, the American labor movement lost 400,000 members. 400,000 members. And these statistics really frustrate me, quite frankly, because they really obscure the people that are behind them. This isn't about a few dollars uh, in salary for union officers, despite what Fox News would try to tell you. Each of those numbers, each and every one of those numbers, represents a person who has lost a job who no longer has a voice at work. And now, think about all of those conversations at the kitchen table, all those families sitting there, fearing what comes next or what doesn't come next, who worry about how to keep a home and what to do about the loss of health care or the loss of a pension. You see, while well, union density uh, has been falling for years, along with it, so is the fate of the American middle class. A chart of union membership rates uh, shows twin red lines. Our rates falling and the middle class falling together. See, the two are connected, and it couldn't be more clear. And what that means is, because America's workers have less representation, less voice, their productivity has become detached from their income. So workers produce more, but earn less. Retirement security has fallen. And the gap between the wealthiest and working people is as bad or worse than it's ever been at any time in the past century. Now, that's bad for our economy, and it's bad for America. See, the loss of union members also weakened the institutions of the labor movement. And the loss of those members has made it harder to organize, to win the things that our economy needs. The labor movement seeks public dollars for infrastructure because those dollars create jobs. That's true. But also because world-class infrastructure is necessary to make America more competitive. So we want everyone in America to have access to health care and to quality public education. Of course that's good for working people, but would we all be better off in a country where all of us are healthier and all of us have a real opportunity to learn? Doesn't that make us stronger as a country? See, working people want to revive American manufacturing and they want to restore public services because that would create jobs. 
but we want prosperity and economic growth, the kind of broad, sustainable prosperity built from a virtuous cycle of investment that if fuels innovation, that fuels investment, that fuels innovation. See, for the national labor movement to play its part in helping workers organize, we really must open union membership up and make the benefits of representation available to all workers. We need to create new models of worker representation. We need to be more strategic and more forward-looking. We need to face this challenge collectively. All of us who are fortunate enough to represent working people today and all of us who care about the future of workers, including all of us in this room, what will it be? Will it be the Taxi Worker Alliance uh, proved to be the model? Will Working America, our Walmart, Warehouse Workers for Justice, the Restaurant Opportunity Center, or the Fight for 15, or innovative efforts to help car wash workers organize in LA and New York City, and here in Chicago, in a partnership between the Steelworkers and Arise here in Chicago. See, when we restore worker representation, we can restore the American dream.